I've heard of people tipping Wales to win it. I was actually oh, man, offended. I, I was I like, I'm what? telling you, I would not. I would I not put it past them. If not, we lose the it's first Warren game, Gatlin's. yeah. Warren Gatlin is a cute. Ireland are I won't so say good, it. <laughs> Joe presents House of Rugby, United Rugby Championship, together with Bank of Ireland, proud supporter of the four Irish provinces. Hello and welcome along to House of Rugby. I'm Greg O'Shea and I'm joined with my lovely teammates, Lindsay and Jason. How are you doing, guys? Great. I'm just delighted we're all back together now. Yeah, it's great. We're getting a nice yeah. flow, isn't it? The three yeah. of us together. How are you, Jason? All good. All good. Delighted to be back. Yeah, we've we'll loads to get you. So we'll get stuck in straight away? Yeah, me too. Yeah. So um, in this show, we have a lot going on. We're actually going to listen to an interview you did, Jason, with Anthony Watson. Yep. And played with England and Lions. He's an incredible player. We're going to have your, listen to your chat you had with him. And then after that, we're actually going to talk to Ty Leader, who played with Connacht and he's over in the USA now. Um, so we have those two coming up later in the show. But I actually got to speak to Josh Vanderfleer last week. Do you know when I ran away? Yes. And yeah. Pat jumped in my seat and he did a much better job than me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, you're first. You heard you're first. We have to keep his confidence levels. Come on. <laughs> yeah. And I ran out to Dunleary and I caught Josh Vanderfleer just before he got on the flight to go to Portugal with the Irish um, team because they're over in Quinta de Lago at the moment, living their best lives, Very warm nice. weather training for the Six Nations. Followed them on Instagram, guys. They're just having the best crack. They're golfing and everything. NFL on the beach. I, was like, I know, oh. yeah. Some life, isn't it? That's Listen, it. I was so angry. I was just like, right, that's it. <laughs> so you only want to unfollow them because you don't want to see all the, yeah, yeah. you know, what they're getting up to. But then you're like, then I'll have FOMO if they're drunk. Yeah. So, like, I'm sure they're having intense training sessions as well. Like, but oh, it's a good way to, like, you're going into a very, very intense, like, whatever it is, eight or nine weeks, six nations. Go out and relax. Chill out. Get some sun into you. They yeah. seem to have a great balance, yeah. And it's what Josh actually spoke about. So listen to this quick uh, teaser clip first and then we'll, I'll chat to you further after that. Greg O'Shea about to brave the elements. Ah! Hi guys, I'm Greg O'Shea and I'm here with Connecticut. I'm in Dunleary. Luckily, we have the weather for it and I'm meeting up with a very special player today. World Rugby Player of the Year, Josh van der Fleer. It's incredible. So not only was it mental resilience and I presume talking to those lads that helped you get through that time, but you probably did a lot for your nutrition to kind of get your knee back that quickly, did you? I mean, I basically tried to, when you're such a long-term injury like that, you're trying to get like even the smallest little marginal advantage, the, the little 1%, I suppose you'd say. One thing that's so important with, especially knee injuries, is, is how your leg strength and how you build that up. You might finish a rehab session, you might have a quick protein shake, um, maybe a shot of collagen after some of the rehab stuff that helps helps with the regeneration there. Um, so, it was, so it was, I suppose it was a mix a mix of things, but definitely uh, find like the multivitamins, the the omega the omegas they were they were brilliant. And it's it's obviously with all these things, it's you're just looking for small margins. It's really hard to say, oh, that's what it was. It was I took this or I did this rehab exercise. You have all these tiny little things that kind of build towards... It's all the one percent. Yeah, exactly, day, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Josh, for a, a lot of people out there, they probably want to know what a normal week looks like for you. So I presume you're training nearly every single day, are you? Um, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, pretty full on. Um, i say Monday, Tuesday, we'd probably be in... You'd be in 7.30, 8 o'clock, different smaller meetings. We'd kick off properly around 9 o'clock and... Uh, You'd be in till, till three or four then both days and then Thursday, a bit shorter, more condensed. Um, Getting ready for the weekend. Yeah, exactly. Captain's run then maybe an hour and a half, two hours. You'd be in uh, a bit of a run around and uh, getting some rehab, physio, massage, that kind of thing in. Yeah. So, uh, so it's, it's all go all the yeah, time. It's really, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. good. There's, there's good breaks, I suppose. The, the, you have the evenings off and then uh, Wednesday you can take time when, if you want it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a good balance between working hard and and getting your recovery as well. Yeah, for sure, because it's just constant rugby, especially with playing with Leinster, the European Cup, and then you go into the Irish setup for Six Nations, and it's just non-stop week in week out. And so, how do you keep your body in order? And your recovery must be one of your main priorities, is it? Definitely can be tough. First thing after a game, um, finish a game, just get a protein shake in. I'm not not normally that hungry. Um, after a game, just your stomach's all over the place because you've just exerted so much energy. Yeah. Um, just get a shake in, um, then as soon as you can, you get you get a meal in, and it pretty much stuff my face that evening, uh, <laughs> eating as much as you can, trying to replace some of the calories. Yeah. Um, and then getting things like like going for a sea swim, um, getting a sauna in, uh, 
going for a walk, anything that kind of loosens up the legs. Just keep it ticking it over. Exactly. Yeah, and that's what keeps it together. So you obviously got it right because you're still sitting here in one piece <laughs> and, and you're flying a plane out of your skin. So uh, today's a recovery day for you. So should we get in the water? Sounds good. Right, let's, let's, go. Go. Yes, on, let's go. Let's <laughs> go. All right, so yeah, it was a great little chat with Josh. And the first thing that I kind of noticed about him was he was so modest. Mm -hmm. Like he is technically the best player in the world, like he has yeah. that title. Yeah. And you wouldn't think about it at all, like chatting away to him, we're just strolling around. And I kind of started back where, I was very conscious of like not asking him the stereotypical questions yeah. of, so how would you think uh, Andy Farrell is as a coach? <laughs> and like, you know, Leinster and all this stuff. Like yeah, yeah. I wanted to kind of get stuck into him a little bit and I eventually got pulled it out of him. We had some good little nuggets of information. I went all the way back to um, his school uh, time, all the way up into the academy. And he actually was telling me a funny story that, when he got into the academy initially, he was just one of the young fellas, you know, kind of coming in and out of yeah. training. And he was in UCD studying and he got a call being like, someone has dropped out of senior training. Can you make it in? So he obviously runs out of the lecture, has no boots, borrows boots off some random guy <laughs> in the UCD, gets the training to Leinster. And, and he's in like training with like, you know, Rob Kearney and Brian O'Driscoll, mm -hmm. all the top dogs at the time. And he says he got a pass off Brian O'Driscoll and he drops it. Oh, First no, off, no. And he's just like, no. <laughs> he's like, I'm never going to play for Leinster yes. ever again. What a uh, baptism. <laughs> so much a baptism of fire. Like, and I just loved like the humility you had to kind of tell us that story. Yeah. That it wasn't all just sunshine and rainbow. It was like, you know, running around UCD trying to get into the academy sessions and things like that. Um, so he definitely earned his stripes. And another cool thing that I kind of got from the interview was... So you remember in the 2021 Six Nations when Will Connors was starting at seven? Yes. And he was kind of like the... Josh two was hands in and, and out, wasn't it? Yeah, he yeah. was in and out, but it was mm. more so Will Connors' jersey, wasn't yeah. it? You remember that time? And I chatted to him, I was like, what was it that happened? So it was only about 18 months ago. Yeah. What's happened between then and now that has made you the best player in the world from nearly not starting with Ireland? And he was quite honest with me and he was like, to be honest, I thought I was actually playing well. And he didn't know what he had to do different, but he didn't sit down and complain about it. He went and like spoke to Stuart Lancaster and he spoke to Leo Cullen and he actually started picking out parts of other people's games so he could improve. So he was like, Will Connors chop tackling, you know, unbelievably is that. And then Scott Penny's carrying and Caelan Doris just around the park and him offering up for carries and things like that. And he said he picked a little bit from each player, like picked their brains and then he worked it out himself. And he just like made his arsenal of ability even mm, better. Yeah. And one other thing he noticed that um, I think Stuart Lancaster said it to him was like he wasn't offering up enough on the pitch he was being like a tip on pass and stuff and he was just rocking out and he said that he was going to be start stepping up and carrying the ball and try and get some extra meters mm. and you noticed it when he came back that yeah. he was just carrying more it's so stuff. funny because it's so it was so unnoticed all of a sudden she says Josh Ryan if you can carry now because yeah. he was always an unbelievable tackler he used to rack up 20 tackles a game with ease yeah. and like, he's that's always huge a nice element. guy yeah even on the pitch like that and that was one thing probably He's so nice. I, I don't even want to use the word infuriate me, but he did. He did because he didn't carry. He was always the nice guy who gave yeah. everyone else the opportunity. He's even selfish. I can hear Absolutely. Yeah. And now he's like gain line after gain. Like his carries are ridiculous. His footwork into contact. Um, so it seemed like he just collected everyone's DNA from everyone, isn't it? And just yeah. made himself into this man machine. So that's exactly what he is. Man yeah. machine. <laughs> done pretty well for him. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny the contrast. And we all noticed like, geez, he's carrying all the time. Yeah. And he literally, he chose to do it. He's like, no, I'm going to start stepping up and taking the ball. And it's just it's such a good lesson for any young players coming up to take the initiative, stop complaining and do something about it. Because Josh thought he was doing everything he could and he just went, goes, no, nah, I'm obviously not. And he went and picked up more stuff and started offering a bit more and working hard. And now within 18 months, he became the best player in the world. So I thought that was a really cool lesson I took from him. Um, Don't and on your laurel is like there's always room for improvement, essentially. Exactly. What, he's, what he's saying. But he kind of looked at his, his kind of work-ons rather than what he had. Do you know that way? And mm. I think a lot of elite players, like if you're not working towards something, like you might as well hang up your boots because you always have to have goals and I think that's a, like yeah big point you've just said there is like look at your work on so always try to be the best player and it's it, you put in a vulnerable position to kind of go to a coach well I if you go to a coach and say well I feel I'm poor on this this and this but how to help me they yeah. kind of invest in you a little bit more do you know yeah. um, show the initiative like, absolutely yeah. and they know you want to learn and you're hungry you exactly. Know, yeah. It's hard to identify that now. Do you I know think there's a lot of lads just sit back, or a lot of women that sit back in rugby, and they just go, "Oh, I'm just not getting picked," and they do nothing about yeah. it. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Like, or he flipped it all around at 18 months and became the best player in the world. And I asked him about that, and I was like, "Look, I know you're quite modest, as you're saying there, Lindsay's probably the nicest guy in the world. Nicest. Yeah. So kind. You wouldn't think about it at all. There's no aura about him. 
But I was like, come on, like, do you know, how do you feel the pressure now that you are the <laughs> best player in the world? And he goes, he's kind of aware that more eyes are on him. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I said, was it always a goal of, you, of yours to become the best player in the world? Like, did you write it on a piece of paper and mm. stuff? And he was like, I actually did. He said he wrote down on a piece That's of paper, true. I want to become the best player in the world. Like only like two seasons ago or something. And he worked on it. So oh even though he's like this kind, like a uh, lot of humility, like in the media, he has this kind of such drive behind yeah, him. Yeah. And he is writing down his goals and he is chasing these things. So it's cool to see him ticking them off. Um, did he tell you what the Brian O'Driscoll give out <laughs> He didn't. He didn't say it. He's too uh, nice yeah. to anyway. Wasn't he it? wouldn't oh. throw anyone under the bus. Like. No, he wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously we kind of moved on to talking about this year coming up. And what I was kind of surprised about was that he straight out said, "Yeah, we want to win the Six Nations, win the World Cup." Like there was no like pussyfooting around. It, it just goes, "Yeah, we want to win that's it." What you want? That's what you want to hear. What a mindset! That's, like. that's what we were saying a couple of weeks ago. I was like, "Why not? Go for it all." But sure, Farrell well, is kind of instilled that, isn't it? Yeah, that's what he said. He yeah. said, the last time, remember you had that thing up ahead of the 2019, sorry, not 2019 World Cup, sorry, mm. yeah. When Joe Smith was there and just kind of a year out from that, Steve Hansen was like, you know, the target's on Ireland's back now. Like, let's see how they deal with being the hunted. And we didn't deal with it. And then this time he was like, we learned from that. He said, let's, let's take ownership of being number one in the world. It's like, yes, we are number one in the world. Come at me, mm-hmm. is what they're saying this time. And that's the attitude to have. Yeah, it's so time. cool, isn't it? Yeah, straight up, like looked in my eyes. Yeah, we want to win it. And I was like, okay, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so we. <laughs> you had this awkward silence. Okay, what's the expression? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's a really good chat. Definitely give it a full listen, guys, on uh, Connecticut social media. <coughs> it's going to be on YouTube, and there'll be clips on Connecticut social media. So definitely give it a look. Um, because it's a really good one and the guys are over in Quintet Lago now as I said and Mm. you see their Instagram they're playing golf and they're having a bit of crack but I saw on Jacob Stockdale's video that he said they had three hard sessions and then they got a day off so as you're saying Jason they're finding that nice balance and they seem to be in a good spot Mm. yeah that's it that's what we need that's what we need definitely so will we move on to the URC that happened on the weekend we did okay so first game up who will we go to we'll go to Ulster first yeah Yeah, they won 35-5 at home Seem to be back in winning ways. They're playing well, aren't they, Lindsay? Yeah. I was very impressed with Nathan Doke. He started, he had, a good, uh, he had a good snipe there and got a good try. And he was kind of, he um, obviously identified that they needed to kind of move that ball really quick at the breakdown. And we kind of, we for, um, we just saw glimpses again of what Ulster can do and what they had leading in, you know, that form that led in before their 6 out 7 kind of streak where they, they went on a losing streak. But they've won 2 out 2 now, back to back. And I just think there was a couple of players that kind of stood up that have been obviously left out of Ireland and, you know, are probably hurting. So um, I was impressed. Yeah. I was impressed with them. Yeah, I talked to Wayne Bullen, it was a huge standout. Like, I remember saying a few weeks back that, you know, Rassi said that the reason he left him out of the Autumn International is what he wanted him to rest up. He had nothing to prove. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing some South African people kind of saying, oh, I think he's done. And some of my own friends kind of thinking, no, he's done. Dwayne Vermeulen like, is going to be in that <laughs> World Cup squad and he's going to be one of the best players in the World Cup again. I don't care how old he is. Yeah, no, he's he's going to be the man because he's just, when he, w- when he raises his game to that level, it's just, I know he also injured poor Evan Roo, so he might have taken his competition out with that bit of a turtle rock uh, kind of a uh, term. But uh, I think, look, he was outstanding. Um, Michael Lowry played really well as well, so he probably disappointed he didn't make the Ireland squad, but very hard to make that. Well, his Ireland footwork squad. was yeah. like electric. It was like the Michael Lowry of old, you know, he just actually, from the word go, I actually got to watch that game. Uh, in full so he, just his footwork um, electric he was just getting in and out he was so elusive mm. do you know so that form again that brought him in and I think for it was his try now with um, oh, Stuart Moore and who played centre who played actually very well and um, oh, who was on the, the wing Maxim Maxim ben Maxim yeah, yeah. was on yes, the wing yes. so um, there was a nice interplay change from, for Larry to finish off so again it was kind of just really intricate piece of play for Mullen was an absolute animal at the breakdown he He's was absolutely monster. key to just the physicality that you know Ulster needed to bring and then they were able to move that ball quick and re- really move South Africans around the park so hopefully this is a kick on point for, for Dan McFarlane and his team because it was it was refreshing to see that these players hadn't gone anywhere. Do you so know what I mean? They, and they actually, needed it. they needed yeah. that win because they. I know the Salem was a big win. Like we were saying there a few weeks back, you know, Ulster season is collapsing, and all of a sudden they're in the round of sixteen. No comment. Uh, and uh, <laughs> now they're back up into the third, I think, in their fourth in the. 
Uh, you are seeing now, so they're still it's fourth in, now, I think. Yeah, so they're no, they're into third. Third, they're third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. What's so good about that win at home against Stormers is that Stormers are in second, so they have to close oh. in that gap between themselves and Stormers. There's only it's only two points between them and Stormers. So Ulster are back; they're totally fine, like sitting cushy and third there in the URC table. But you're saying there, Jason, it's so mad that they're into the round of 16 and they only won one game in the European Cup. I did, what there was a, a comment format. on our YouTube last week. Someone was giving out to me, kind of saying like, um, "What about this for Ulster?" And it was like, it's not an attack on Ulster. Can I just system, make that yeah, clear? It's, it's an format. attack on the system. If Munster or Connacht or Leinster were in that situation, I'd say the same thing. I just don't agree with the system. And it's it's something we, we were talking about during the week, Pat. There's a, the, the, even Martin and I are saying it's a joke. It's gone too complicated. So they're looking at either going back to the system before 24, 2015, when there was 20 teams, or even going back and making more groups and keeping it 24 from that system that was there before 2010-ish, mm-hmm. I'm guessing. Yeah. So there's two systems they could go back to. But, I mean... It's just scrapped I, two Yeah, pool you want things. your six yeah. pool games and make it, and you want to be in a pool. You want it to be yeah. interesting. And if you, if I know we play, it gets played now over a week shorter than mm. it used to get played over, so there's a bit of issues there and the French teams won't play an extra week. But you can take out the, 60, the round of 16 if you have to yeah, and, and put the extra pool game in there mm. instead and go straight to the quarters and bring it back. But yeah. yeah, but that's the thing. Get rid of these two massive pool, pools. Just make your group stages and then just play them off quarterfinals like we did. What well, It wasn't broken no, before. Like, so see, the only reason it? they did it was because of COVID. That was the excuse okay. the last time. I said, OK, we have to bring it from 20 up to 24 because at the time there was they were too close in the leagues in the Premiership in the top 14 and the URC that a lot of games didn't get played. So like, OK, yeah. they could have got sued essentially because the team was in ninth but they didn't get to play the remaining games they're like okay so we just extended out 24 teams but they still haven't brought it back to 20 yet <laughs> yeah. no. it's been three seasons three seasons it's been now like so just it's yeah. crazy it is crazy yeah but he still got through and fair play to them because um, they seem to be back in form thank god but the next game we had on was we'll go with Munster our very own Munster we're away in Benetton Treviso and you know what it was a bit shaky there for a while Jason <laughs> Benetton came out with two tries and I was like surely not like. <laughs> do you know what I've been watching Benetton closely all season so like we'd often clip up the clips and for making for reels and stuff for rugby Joe and every time I watch them I was like my god these guys play some good rugby don't they the tries like even the first two tries they scored like and I've been watching these tries all season going what is it that they're missing? I suppose maybe it's just in defence and the fact that their game management quite isn't there with the big teams. But boy, can those boys score tries. Yeah. <laughs> they're exceptional. Two really, like none of their tries were like just simple. Like they were nice. Offloading. Offloading. You know what I mean? Bit sassy. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Bit of je ne sais quoi. Joué, joué. What about like Munster? Him. What about Munster? That's, that's two weeks now like where after seeing this like Munster are now this I have to do the, double again, the last couple of weeks like because they've been playing stunning rugby yeah. John Hodden was sensational again some of the offloads some of the running lines fresh some of the cross field kicks everything everyone played well and it's like it's actually fun to watch Munster again but dare yeah. I say it <laughs> what was cool was seeing the back row it was so young but still so dynamic so you had Jack O'Sullivan at 6 I think you would yeah. Candelan at 8 and you would yeah. Hodden at 7 yeah. 3 young fellas I think they're all max maybe 22 that's all yeah. even younger and they played incredible Hodnett was playing out of his skin best player in the pitch yeah like making breaks scoring tries offloading like and it's just it's funny that he like that he'd be nowhere near an Irish squad and he's playing incredible like yeah. there's just so many good back rows so I thought he was in, he really really good a good guy for Munster for the next couple of years for sure or that back row for the next couple of years yeah because eventually Peter Manley has to retire oh, yeah, do you know so what I mean yeah. but, like, it's funny that we're saying now as well and it kind of goes back to what you said uh, all those weeks back like Munster now all of a sudden are up six in the table right yes. they're knocking on the door of the top four I was looking at it this morning kind of going okay they're, they have three home games coming up next mm. three home games and then they've got to go to them. They've got their, I don't know, in between that or after that, they've got their uh, last 16 tie with the Sharks, which, you know, they're still in the Champions Cup. It's going to be tough. But then they go to South Africa after that for like two weeks to play the Sharks and the Lions, I think it is. Yeah. So if they win those three home games, then all of a sudden they're in with the, they're in with the bike, yeah. they're in with the mm-hmm. shout for that top four. But like, at the very least, it looks like we don't have to worry too much now that we won't <laughs> make top eight. But oh like, yeah, we're nicely sitting in sixth. Yeah. Um, we're four points ahead of the Sharks that are in eighth. So there's a nice little cushion there. And we're only three points off fourth and the Bulls are in fourth. So yeah. once they're sitting nice we there at sixth. Home games, like, and maybe get a few bonus points along yeah. the way. And all of a sudden they're like, Whoa. A couple of weeks ago we were, they were <laughs> down in the teens. They're like, oh no. Um, so what we predicted is coming true. But hopefully they can hold it together now. What did you make of it, Lindsay? The I thought they were exceptional. Um, yeah. The only thing is like, I know Ben Healy's not going to the end of the season, but I thought his crossfield kick was exceptional. And then mm. his skip pass to Joey Carberry. 
He played really uh, well. I was like, why are we losing this yeah, lad? Yeah, he did. I had to say, like, you know, for everything he's did well, like Ben Healy was just kind of... And even his pass on the game line, he got John Hognan in for that break. He got Jack O'Sullivan in. He was like such an athlete. He took off like it was like, meow. <laughs> you know, so um, Kendallin as well was exceptional. So it's lovely to see him. We've spoken about this all season for just, you know, take a chance on your younger fellas. And obviously we went to Leinster and their academy players. But it, it, it is needed because when your guys are away at international duty, which is what every we want the provinces and the players to aspire to, Who's going to look after now these next couple of weeks and get you in that top, hopefully top four? Yeah. Um, I suppose you're looking there with the backer that I named the three yeah. young fellas, Jack, Alex and John. And then we had Dimmer Barron in the front row yeah. and things like that. And young fellas come Paddy on. Paddy Patterson so there Paddy at Patterson. nine, who again had another great yeah. try. Actually, Calvin Nash's chip and chase to, to get Patterson in. Mm. Like they're playing expansive heads up rugby, which mm. is refreshing. And it's lovely to see the players express themselves. And I think Calvin Nash ever since his trip to New Zealand yeah. for that... Uh, the experimental, I suppose yeah. that. I think it's the fact as well that they know now because they've seen in the last few weeks when the Champions Cup came around and all the international boys were there. Mm. But yeah, Conor Murray was dropped for Paddy Patterson in that first game, and then the second game, and then like uh, mm-hmm. uh, Earls, Earls was still out of the squad. So they're like, okay, normally before, no matter how well you played, as soon as the boys came back, you're out of the mm. team. Yeah. But now they're like, okay, well if we play well and we show enough, round three will start us and keep the fitness. So that gives you like, I mean, if you know as soon as Peter Amani or Conor Murray or Keith Earls come back that you're out of the team. It's very hard to bring yourself up to, you bring yourself to that level, but can you get yourself to that level? Yep. Which is what they can do now and what it's shown. They yeah. will be rewarded. And even Fekatoa has been brilliant the last couple of games because he got a great kick up the mm. arse is what he got. We saw Fekatoa and Frisch in the centre together, which is mm. good. What you make of that? Good, good. Like, I thought Frisch played well. Like, I mean, he did really well for that try. And then like, it was, uh, you kind of take it the way he takes it. Like, he yeah. makes it look so easy. He kind of he kind of looks up right and takes it in his left hand from the kick. And it's, uh, I really like him. I thought, I thought, he's, like a smart guy, isn't he? he's a smart, very yeah, he smart, is. very yeah, intelligent player. Always up for the offload. Sometimes he can get caught out a bit, time, mm. bit, bit, bit much with that, but he's strong, very skillful. He's a big lad, in fairness yeah, to him. Big. And Fekatoa now, it's like, what Fekatoa, we know he's Malachi Fekatoa. We know what he can bring, but what he was lacking was his work rate. And, and even his post on Instagram, did you see that? He was very complimentary of um, John Hognett and the players around him. and... Um, so he kind of not only has bought in onto the pitch but into the monster ethos and what the club actually means mm. so I thought that was I found that interesting now over the weekend his posts were not like he posted about his family and stuff like that and yeah. Limerick and wherever he was with but this was specifically about Munster and players around him and, and very complimentary with those around him so I think all in all he, he did yeah. get it and a shout out to Graham Rowntree it's not easy to come in and Piece together what was absolutely what it was in smithereens really from previous oh, coaching. Do you know what I mean? Just like on, it was. And, and Fekatoa, well, funnily enough, I was actually talking to him on Instagram there three days ago because I did an interview with him in the summer and I was like, "Can we do a part two? Like, and follow up because I really want to know yeah. what your experience is like." And he was like, "Yeah, no problem." He said, "Look, I'm off now for the next the next week. Like, cause he'll be away while the URC is But when I come back, he said, just in between the knockouts and stuff, I'll sit down and chat with you." And I was like, "Excellent." So, something so he's a nice guy. To. So, oh, so he's yeah. an excellent gent. When I like when I sat down and spoke to him over the summer, like he was so nice, such Brilliant. a nice guy. So Good hopefully, because it'd be interesting space. to see what he, th- like, you know, it's, I'd say it's been a tough few months for him. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, 100%. Moving on to the unstoppable team of Leinster. They're at home against Ooh. Cardiff, 38-14. <laughs> and not only 38-14, it, it doesn't say, it doesn't tell the full story. They were 31 nil up after 66 minutes. Yes, I'm Ridiculous. glad you said that. Ridiculous. I'm sure how many had me, eight academy players in there. They had 14 changes, you know. Thir- number 13 is unlucky for some but it was 13 yeah. out of 13 for us and 17 13 out of 13 games in the URC as you said their 20 internationals were away mm-hmm. which is nuts and uh, most of their academy were playing <laughs> Yep. I didn't even know some of the names and that's just my ignorance not knowing the Leinster Academy. Too, it's impossible now because they just pull out a new sheet of players mm. every week like, and go, hey, this guy's class. <laughs> yeah. I think Max O'Reilly scored a try, didn't he, on the wing and he got his first cap and uh, Brian Deeney, who got his first cap what, two yeah. weeks ago and he scored a try. He's got another one. And, yeah, well, they both uh, got Cosgrave their first caps a while but, ago but yeah. Cosgrove was at 15. No, I think I Max think. O'Reilly got a first one if I'm not mistaken yeah. on, the, oh, he, on the wing. Um, playing on the wing he's definitely played a couple of times for Leinster already has he sorry yeah, yeah, for sure yeah I'm trying to think yeah there's two new caps game. anyway um, yeah. for the lads and yeah it was just amazing to see again like no no drop and Max Deegan like we're talking about Michael Lowry and, and Nathan Doak who were kind of like the forgotten men and weren't in the Ireland squad and then you're kind of looking at Max Deegan who yeah. who has actually played in his last outing for an Ireland jer- in an Ireland jersey played well and he was exceptional and got played the match there the weekend and yeah you're right 31 points up and they probably would be just disappointed with the kind of two soft tries they, they yeah. let in. Um, and Liam Turner with an opportuni- opportunistic try. Cardiff trying to like 
play the ball out with their 22, which you don't really do in the <laughs> 80th minute. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, all in all, it was a, another efficient. And Luke McGrath again, two tries. Like I was just about to say, it's yeah. good, good to see. Like we're talking about all these young guys coming in, but like he he is a stalwart and a kind of a very key piece of that Leinster team because he's in there week in week mm. out. And I think he's the kind of guy. I think he kind of. Uh, we call it Ross Byrne syndrome. Like he kind of, f- I think he'll would be feel a bit aggrieved not mm. to be in and amount of conversation for the Ireland squad because he's so consistent and he's there every week. Like the same as Ross Byrne, but like Ross Byrne had to wait. So maybe like there is an opportunity for him to slip in before the World Cup. You just yeah, don't you know. Say if that, an injury you could also or say that about Jack O'Donoghue. Do you know what I mean? Who yeah, plays week in week out, and he's nowhere it, yeah. near the Irish team as well. But like, it's even tougher, I think, to get into that back row. I think because that's just like so absolutely hard. ridiculous. But I think like if you look at the the. The, the, the nines in Ireland at the moment the three guys that are in there are probably the three guys that should be in there but next in line has got to be Jack McGrath even Luke you know, McGrath. Caelan, sorry Luke McGrath excuse me and like even Caelan Ravis last weekend like we'll go on to that later He's on as well and yeah. you've also like you've also got the fact that John Cooney but who's probably going to be playing for Scotland in a few weeks time after uh, uh, what's his name said that he's probably going to call him up more than likely yeah. to have conversations but yeah I do think he's someone that he's definitely the next choice there and there's a, could be an argument there that he could be there ahead of one of the three that's there like yeah, Luke McGrath, an mm. outstanding game. Such a pivotal position in that team. And he's just always, he's been there for years. Like He's still a young fellow, but there for years. And mm. really good game he had. Uh, I'd say just having guys like him and maybe Ross Maloney just, and Reese Ruddock just yeah. keeps those young guys in yeah. in order. What do you think, Lindsay? Yeah, it's just those, like, obviously you're 31 nil up, but that is, it's that mental side, isn't it? And you, it, that's very hard to do until you're in games where your back is against the wall, which was Ospreys a couple of weeks ago where the young lads came through in the end. Like, it was a tough out game away. So... Um, Joe Ross Maloney is another guy he just doesn't get the credit he just goes about class his business he's class isn't he yeah. goes about his business Reese Rudder kind of the same thing like you don't actually miss them until they're out <laughs> and you don't really appreciate exactly <laughs> what they do like every time he plays a game he's playing a final yeah. yeah, that's the kind of attitude he has. Like no matter who he's playing, it's like I'm playing finally. He's always he always looks angry. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and like he's a guy who gets rewarded for his like performances, thankfully. But he never kind of drops, does he? Never no, kind of rests on his laurels. You could argue that people like Ross Maloney and Reece Ruddock are more valuable than like a Johnny Sexton in the sense that they're there every week, Hell keeping yeah. Leinster in order, keeping mm-hmm. everything intact, making sure the points are coming in. Yep. Where Johnny goes away and plays for Ireland, comes back, might play a couple of games for Leinster. Mm-hmm. But those guys are there week in, week out. Like that's what makes Leinster who they are I think yeah yeah, but like I think you know we're r- rugby lovers enthusiasts players you know and we see the the we know the work that doesn't get the reward and that's the work <laughs> these guys do yeah. like it's all well and good being on the end of a try but like have you looked at the phases that built up to that and all the yep. clearing of rocks and winning a ball and c- gain line carries and winning line outs and it's the little little moments that are pivotal to that that big one you know that big defining moment that everyone celebrates but like it's the little jigsaw yeah. pieces before that like and yeah. that's where these boys like Reese Ruddock jeez he just I don't know how he's not injured more actually because to be <laughs> honest he just takes the ball against three or four men what's his nickname again Manchild they call him that's his nickname oh yeah <laughs> Manchild <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Leinster at the top of the URC with 13 out of 13, as Lindsay said, Ooh. and they're just running away with the thing. 61 <laughs> points at the top. Closest to them is Stormers with 45 points in second. It's just, seems like a foregone conclusion on, that Leinster are going to finish. I'm just going to give us a new Come name. On. We're like the pantomime villain of the rugby yeah. world. Yeah, look. Yeah. Yeah. And I might be wrong, but I think Leinster are 17 games out of 17 in total all yeah, competitions. Yeah, yeah. Just, just nuts. Like, and they're Say that again, Greg. <laughs> 17 <laughs> out of it's 17. It's probably time we, this, we don't have to split Leinster in half. Yeah. We had oh, this here's like Dublin football. We had the conversation with Dubs. It's time to do it now. Yeah, well done, Leinster. You're flying it. <laughs> it's uh, a joke, by the way. <laughs> go, <laughs> going over to the west of Ireland, Connacht are playing. 43-24, they beat the Lions. They played really, really well. Um, we had Blade got a hat trick, Caelan Blade. He was light and he was like a man possessed, that fella. Incredible. Mm. Uh, we probably give a shout out to Jack Carty, who's become the top point scorer in Connacht history, breaking Eric Elwood's all time record. And uh, just incredible stuff out of Jack Carty. Just consistency again. There's another person, like we mentioned, yeah. like a Reese Ruddock and a Ross Maloney, just getting the work done week in, week out, no complaints. Um, but would you ever think, Lindsay, that a Caelan Blade or Jack Hart will ever get a sniff of an Irish jersey? Do you know what? You took the words out of my I was watching them there Saturday evening after we finished our own game and Jack Harty skipped pass, um, which led to one of the tries. And I was like, how are you not here? Like he does some, accept, like his cross field kick two weeks ago to John, for John Porch's try in the Challenge Cup. And you're kind of looking at these moments of magic. Yeah. And you're like, 
How are you not? Like, what are you not doing to get in an Ireland look jersey? Look around, Joey Carberry can't even get into the squad oh, now. I know. You've got, look how good Ben Healy was the weekend. He's fecking off to Scotland because yeah. he can't even get a sniff to get into our training squad. Do you know what? John Cooney with the nines going off. We're giving out. Like, John Cooney's brilliant. Mm. Like, that's why Caelan Way can't get in. You're forgetting about, uh, his name has gone from head now as well, uh, Connacht. Back up nine. Kieran Marmion. Kieran Marmion. Kieran Marmion played a pivotal role that time he beat the All Blacks back in 2018. 2018 not even that long ago, was one of the best players mm. in the bitch. <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's like, you know. You're yeah. looking around, and you know, and you're like, and like Bundy can't even get into the squad now, whatever is going on underneath <laughs> ah, that flight. That but there is absolutely more. He's obviously gone wild or something. I don't know, but I won't be Bundy's sending out any drama. But Huh? Bundy's no, he hasn't been in the last few Connacht squads. Like we were talking about that last oh, week about yeah. Munster sniffing around, and Andy Friend was asked about it since. And Andy Friend said that it's only paper talk, but then he kind of backtracked and he was like, as far, to, down to my something. knowledge, he'll be here next year. Like, and I was like, well, look, you won't even be here next year. Like, so <laughs> what do you, yeah. and Does he really it, care, it, wasn't, like, it yeah. wasn't much. Like, I mean, look, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but like, I don't think it was a very, oh no, absolutely not, he's mm. committed. And he and he also said that he was he he was he stood by his decision not to play him in that game last week where they lost out in the home uh, last sixteen because because yeah, they but he did well it's they really lost away to Newcastle yeah but it? he didn't play him he's like oh I still stand by my decision not to play him so there's something going on there like, I don't care you can, I mean, and everyone in the street can see that yeah and it, it, like it'll eventually come out but like there's some like either he's had a fallout or I don't know but then like Bundy is in Portugal but like you're kind of looking at centres again you're like he hasn't had game time Henshaw's yeah. only come back from injury. Um, Jamie Osborne deserves to be in the call up but do you take a chance on him because we're away to the principality and that will define our Six Nations I and how Bundy successful will play in the Irish he probably will but it's yeah. crazy to think that like, he's, like he just go straight in and start like I mean I personally like I would have McCluskey in there with Ring Russ I put him in high five there to that see that's what I would Take do but, uh, you know, yeah. much, I love like Bundy's class but uh, throwing him into the Test Cauldron against Wales in the Principality against a fired up Welsh team like under Gatlin. Like he'd, Gatlin do, he'd do the job, Bundy would. I'm sure he would. Do like, you think McCluskey deserves it more? Physicality yeah. wise, I'd pick yeah. McCluskey, I think. I think and yeah, and I think he's deserved it. And I think he, if we're going to give him that chance, he deserves to really build on his performances. I think yeah. he's a guy who needs consistency and that belief that we've, That's we've spoken it. And about. And I think uh, what McCluskey brings in as well is that kind of element of surprise where. Like, something like Gatlin's going to have something up his sleeve it's Warren mm-hmm. Gatland I'm actually quite afraid of that first game against Wales I was not I was in before Gatlin came in I was like yeah we're going to walk this game <laughs> I've heard no people offense. I've heard people tipping Wales to win it I was actually oh, man, offended I, I, I was like I'm what? telling you I would not I would I not put it past them if we lose the it's first Warren game Gatland. Yeah. Warren nice. Gatland is a cute Ireland are I won't so say good, it <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean it's Warren Gatland when Warren Gatland coming back in for his first game really in the in the principality do not do not do not think that Warren Gatland Coming in is just too much of a change. Nah, for there's no. every chance they can win that game. There's no like, and I'm like, as, as good as Ireland are, and as like as hopeful as I've, I am of a, a Six Nations win or a Grand Slam, that could be a, 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 a really? slippery first game. Oh, Very I think slippery. we're underestimating this. I think it's the hardest place. And actually, uh, Anthony Watson put that in his interview, didn't he? He's one of his favourite places to go because he was saying the seats are so close, and when yeah. the roof is closed and it's the crowd an, is roaring at you and abusing you. <laughs> yeah. The principality, yeah. yeah. Well, you've, you've nicely moved me on to the next part of this uh, chat is the Six Nations preview, guys. You're welcome. Yeah, well done. <laughs> 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 so we're talking about the predictions. You're predicting that we're going to lose the first game, which no. I don't like. No. no, we're not predicting, but what I'm saying is it's not going to be like all sunshine and roses and we're not just going to storm into Principality get our win and go home it's <laughs> going to be a tough game that That's result will define us won't it yeah. it will define our success in this Six Nations yeah. do you know if if I think it's the it's the one like one fixture I'd be like oh god no like yeah. we need like so we're talking about blood and like players and getting them in I'd be picking our strongest squad going to Wales 100%. now like Think Johnny is in England and France at home oh yeah I'd be <laughs> Johnny, like, okay. Johnny is in like, <laughs> like, you know, we've England and France at home like you're always you're always going to back Ireland and Viva no matter who we play we're going to back Ireland and Viva we've beaten New Zealand there we've beaten South Africa there we've beaten yeah. Australia there we've beaten England there before we've beaten France there you'll back any team in the world to come at us mm-hmm. in the Aviva Okay, going to Scotland. No offense to the Scots, like we're going to beat Scotland in Edinburgh, and I wouldn't be worried about beating Scotland in Edinburgh. I wouldn't be worried about beating Italy over in Italy, but I would be damn worried about going to the Principality and beating Wales. Yep. And the fact that it's the first game, like, is it, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Probably a good thing, mm-hmm. because they said it could be a launch pad or it could be a oh shit, we yeah. lost this. Now we really got it. Now we're backs against the wall for the rest of the tournament. No big time. <laughs> and I think even if Wales lose it, right, I think they're going to have some big. I think they will scalp someone along the way. Like I think hmm. that's the effect Warren Gatlin has. I think he's that Ron O'Gara, like Ron O'Gara with La Rochelle and dismantling Leinster. I think he will have that. I think yeah. he's that extra kind of spice because he will 
look at our weaknesses and he will have something up his sleeve to dismantle He's probably us. the most experienced active coach in the world there, alongside maybe Eddie Jones. Like, mm-hmm. Do you know, he's, people forget like Gatlin started off coaching us how many years ago? You know what I mean? And he was like, I uh, actually read an article during the week about like kind of, he didn't get enough credit because he actually was the first person to come in and really give Ireland a bit of a launch pad and move us on from being the wooden spoon crowd for which was what we were for a long time mm-hmm. so he, he's done that like he's brought away he's won three grand three four grand slams at Wales plus more titles he's coached uh, three line stores beating the All Blacks the he's done the everything like it's Warren Madrid. Gatland he's he will have <coughs> something up his sleeve without a doubt yeah. and he's brought in a couple of new players and he, he said it himself that's the, it's the biggest squad he wouldn't normally pick such a big squad is it 37 man squad he picked yeah. during the week yeah. um, he's Rio Dyer in there who we've, we've given bear. lots of credit on this show with tries week in week out in the URC and had a good autumn international and I think he's four uncapped players in that squad as well so I think when I was asked a question during the week about it, how would it affect I think how him and Steve Borthwick I think he will have uh, the biggest effect initially like mm. like straight away because of the crowd, yet the group of players he's already coached, and then the new players in, I think he'll have such an effect on. I think Bortwick's going to be an interesting one. When we, when we get on to the Anthony Watson chat, like we'll put that part in where he speaks about Bortwick. But the one thing that stood out for me when he was, I was asking him, like I say, he, he loved Eddie Jones. He said he was surprised Eddie Jones mm-hmm. left. To be honest with you, he said he gave him a lot. He complimented Bortwick without saying, "Oh, this isn't a diss on Eddie Jones. This is just what I think Bortwick was." Clear about that, wasn't yeah, he? very clear about that. <laughs> but he pointed out that he said when he saw he's with Leicester Tigers, we signed for him in the summer, which we've been with him at the start of the season. And he came into him like in the summer, like and was basically, "Okay, this is what you need to work on." He said, "I've watched uh, every single one of your carries for the last three years." So he sat down in front of a computer and watched every single carry Anthony Watson made over the space of three seasons, and he was like, "What?" And he's like, that was when I kind of mm. I sat up and I was like, okay, this guy is like, his attention to detail is like second to none. Yeah. So that's what he's going to bring. He said he's very, very clear cut in his, his, in his instructions to his players. So like, you look at that English team on paper. I think maybe like, no offense to Eddie, like Eddie is a bit of a, a wild one. Like, I don't think the players half the time know if they're going to be in the team the following week. Mm. Like, because it's the kind of guy he is. He's a, he's, he's a bit crazy. Yeah, like. he is. But as I think with Bortwick, they're going to be so... He's going to give them such clear instructions and that when you have the squad that they have, mm. that is a dangerous combination. Yeah. And I, that was the interesting part, part of that, yeah. actually. And also that he was so accountable um, as a coach that, yeah. you know, if he made mistakes, he put up his hand. And I think... I think that's a, going to be a culture shock for them that I think they'll have such clarity of how they'll play. They'll be able to express themselves, but they'll have a clear framework of, of something to, like a launch pad. Um, and I think that's the other big point. If he can get England going, they've probably more of a standout selection of four class players to play for. If he can just bring them all together to play, I think I don't think they're going to do it in this Six Nations. I think he's too little time for me personally, but um, I could be probably. Yeah, I think England are too undercooked. I yeah. think yeah. they need more time under Steve Bortwick, but they'll probably be better than what they were, more cohesive and have like a team ethos building in towards the World Cup in the next couple of months. But I don't see them being good enough to win a Six Nations no. with the likes of Ireland, France and Scotland are decent. And even though Scotland have lost their last seven Six Nations opening games when playing away Mm -hmm. which is a mad stat that Pat pulled up for us there so they're going away to Twickenham and they'll have the likes of our very own Ben Healy hopefully on the bench and you're thinking John Cooney's going over as well Jason yeah so he's not uh, we get this right now Pat he's not eligible until like the second or third week of the Six Nations because he had played during the three year stand down so he had played like a game for Ireland the first game three years ago for, so they, they're waiting for that but he said Gregor Towson uh, was asked during the Six Nations launch we had with the Joe lads over there like and he was like um, yeah like I have spoke to him and he is interested and we're interested so and why Finn wouldn't Russell you take him Russell. yeah Finn Russell had a good game against La Rochelle the weekend scoring 24 points so like I'm thinking to my, when, I, when I saw that I was like oh it's Ben Healy now after ruffling feathers and Finn is kind of finally now well, Finn, Finn has to start like because Finn yeah. is the, he's the maverick but he is but, but my only issue with him is he's so he's different to DuPont and DuPont is, is consistent and he's artistic and he flows but Finn Russell can be sublime and then he can be poor for me like he's yeah. inconsistent so I'm like alright do you have a challenge now that you might bring this consistency and really we can see what you can do in a Scotland jersey yeah do you know what I mean that's true he has been like that Like, but like he's a brilliant 10 ah, like, he's he's, I mean yeah. you just he's the one guy like the reason you have him in that 10 jersey is the fact that can he spit. can turn a game yeah like that, you can split up in any defense. Like, you do know, oh, yeah. he yeah. did it in the Champions Cup there. At what game we were watching against a couple Leinster? Of weeks. Against Leinster yeah. When he just out of nothing, and you're like, what? A big skip pass. What big skip pass on his left. How do you even yeah. do yeah. this? Like, yeah. I think Finn Russell starts if he's fifth, and then Ben Healy probably on the bench. Ben's so like reliable 
Do you know what I mean? You bring him on for about 10, 15 minutes. Good guy to bring on as well as, as Munster yeah. have done in the past. If you are like trailing the game by a couple of points and you can get this guy in the bench, you can kick a penalty from 55 metres. Bring him Not on. Not a bad weapon. Like, we've done that a few times. Would you use them then in that axis that you use Carberry or Jack Crowley and, and Carberry in that 10, 12? To 12 That's something. what I was thinking and then bring 12. Ben Healy. Yeah, you can. So you think Scotland have their own They've good centres already? Have, like, but yeah. it'd be, be more, to, more to close the game. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like as in rugby, I know it's probably Eddie that kind of made that uh, when he coined this term finishers. Mm. But like the term finishers, like your bench, especially at elite level test rugby, like the Six Nations, mm. your bench is almost as important as your starting team now. Yeah. So like even like we, that's something we missed on uh, we, we, we meant to chat about is like the bench for Ireland. That bench, what we pick, we have all these great players and we kind of know probably about 95% of the starting lineup, mm. which is fair enough. But that bench, there's probably, you know, five or six positions there, whatever, whatever it is that are there's five or six players that can switch in and out. Up for grabs, yeah. Up for grabs, essentially. So, who would your back row be starting for Wales, Ireland? Who's on your bench? Who's your starting back row? This I found this really hard. Tough. Both. That's a question of both of you. Uh, I, I, I don't know how. I don't know what to put on the, at the bench because it's just very hard. But I know I think my back starting back row is Peter O'Mahony, Josh van der Fleer, and Jack Conan. I think. Well, you went with Conan. I'm going to go with Conan as as. Is that as Sorry, not to tag. Dar- no, sorry. Yeah, Doris. Doris today. Oh, Excuse me. Right. Sorry. Whew. I was getting confused because I, I thought I had Doris at six. I have a Mahoney at six. I have Van der Fleer at seven and Doris at eight. And then, and then who's on your bench? Do you have, I don't know, do you have a Jack Conan there or do you have a Coombs there? I don't know, to be honest with you. Or like, who else have we got in there? I went controversially. It's Coombs at eight. Well. Who'd you go with? Coombs at eight, Doris at six, Van der Fleer at seven and a Mahoney on the bench. I don't think Coombs is ready to start yet. I went for physicality against the Welsh with him, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's why I went with him at eight because I think they will come with physicality against us and try and slow that game down. But then I'm like, oh, you're leaving Jack Conan now, who's finally starting to build as he comes along. Like, it, it was so hard. <laughs> it's not easy. No. Oh, you have? <laughs> oh, I think I'm going to say back rows yourself yeah. with Doris uh, O'Mahony and Van de Fleer with uh, Coombs on the bench. Because I think okay. Coombs can play six and eight and you can chop around other guys. But I think Coombs covers more than Jack Conan. Throw in the second row as well if you're stuck. Throw in the second row as well. He's just such a good person to have on the bench for the back five mm. of the scrum. So I think that's the way they're going to do it. And Coombs, I hold him close to my heart. He's from Skibbereen as a monster man. I was in the academy system with him. He's playing yeah, he's really playing well. well. Look at me now. So I think he's right. going to push his way onto the bench. I think Prendergast might lose out. Yeah. Um, what I'd love to see is what they do is, okay, so if they go with, let's say for talk's sake, they go with McCluskey at 12 and Ringrose at 13. Do you have Aki on the bench as your 23? Because Aki's a 12. That's it. That's all he is. No offence. Like he, he can't play anywhere else. Maybe maybe 13, Like, but he's realistically, he's a 12. But whereas if you had someone like a Jimmy O'Brien in there, he can cover well, See, I had on my, ben- my bench going through this during the week, I had Crowley and O'Brien as my 22 and 23 because they both can play centre, full back. They kind of are utility players. But then I was like, then they're so young. Do you know, it was so hard to play. I didn't have Aki in my, on my yeah. bench. Actually, do you have Crowley or Byrne on the bench? I had Crowley. You Crowley. Do you have Crowley or Byrne on the bench? Crowley. Just because right. he covers more positions. And I think he needs that time now at this stage to really build on really, again, good performances. But like Ross, Ross Byrne has come up there as well. So, And even looking at the nines then, you're like, I was just about to say, the big one, we have to ask ah. that because that is a conversation that we've been going on for 12 months. And now with Murray being dropped out of the Munster squad and Casey playing really well at the moment, it's probably going to be Gibson Park starting. Is it Casey or Murray on the bench? So <laughs> I argued with this because I'm like, if we're ahead, then you want Conor Murray on to manage your game. Yeah. But if you're if it's lying in the balance and you want to really bring a big probably Welsh team and keep that speed of play going, you want Casey. And my heart is saying Gibson Park and Casey, but my mind is like, you need Conor Murray for experience in game management, well, think, especially if you you've Crowley and O'Brien on the bench. Because it's probably going to be Gibson Park starting with speed. Let's be I honest. Think Gibson Park starting. I think yeah. Murray's on the bench. I don't think Casey's put his hand on that jersey oh. just yet, but it's coming like a train. But I think Murray's still holding on to it, Two as you very said. Different lines. Murray's so issue. reliable. Yeah, and it is. It is. What's your game plan? Yeah, and yeah. Casey, just would you back him? We're, we're ahead by two points or something to come on and close out the game with twenty minutes to go. Murray coming on, you're like, all right. No, go. but if you're, I suppose it depends what way your game plan is. But if you were losing. Alright, it was a close game oh, yeah, and you need to speed it up like yeah, yeah. I, I mean I don't think Murray's gonna come on and win it's you a game. Safe, yeah. He's gonna come on and close out a game for you. So are we backing ourselves that like come 60, 70 minutes, we only need a closer. We don't need someone to win the game for us. And I Which think it's is probably the attitude yeah, we should have. Yeah, it's mm. gonna be close. But our attitude should be not I don't know. Do you want spark off the bench or do you want I don't know, familiarity and solidity off the bench? 
Oh, well, look, he too could honestly <laughs> chat till the cows come home. So I'm going to cut in here because you're going to keep chatting. Oh, we will see. We'll Andy Farrell's the one picking the team. So we'll see what comes we'll out. Go but it could, could go <laughs> anyway. Uh, so we think England's going to win. We think uh, Ireland's going to win, but it's going to be close. And then Italy are playing France. They're come in on Italy. They're Italy. Now, I'm um, putting my hands on Scotland to beat England away just for controversy. Okay, cool. Come, huh? And we're um, going to beat Wales yet. Okay. That's going to be the big upset of that round. And France are obviously going to smash Italy away. But Kieran Crowley's doing well with Italy, but I just think France are way too good and they're on a winning streak no. and that's going to be uh, the winning try it's going to be here first winning try against yeah, France at home yeah let's those Italians I know they're not I'm just, I'm Pat, just were you, these two drinking before you came in like. I'm just hoping there's I'm no gonna, way Italy are eating France I'm right. just trying to I don't have it enough into caffeine. existence I'm hoping it into existence not a yeah, chance wishing not it. a chance I like your optimism but there's no way France are way too good I know yeah, and they're building up into their home world cup and so I want to ask you guys standout player for the Six Nations one of them from any team Dupont, Dupont. Yeah, Antoine obvious. Dupont. He's I know, but what I about, actually do like. What about Dupont out of the equation? Because uh, he's obviously going to be. And Mac. Nice, oh. good choice. There can be only one ring Ross. I was going to pick him. I, did, I left him to. You. If he keeps going the way he's going to be going, he's going to be like he's going to be Six Nations player of the tournament. Heard it here first. Yeah, yeah, true. I just think um, for myself, I think. Van der Fleer is just going to be class as always because he's going to start he's going to get 80 minutes every game I think he's going to be standout player which is, they're very obvious ones mm -hmm. but you kind of have to go with the obvious ones that's why they're standout players breakout star um, anyone kind of left Rio Dyer wow I like that one yeah well I am I think he's I think Gatlin will instill that confidence and he'll, he'll have plays to get him into a match and I think once he gets space and his hand on ball I, I see him do great things I like the way your mind's thinking Lindsay Nice. I think I'm a back inside a forwards body. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, <laughs> breakout player. Break I out think star. Jack Crowley. Yeah, Jack Crowley, this is going to be his chance. This is, this is, this is his first real big, big chance. And I think he gets game time, though. I think, yeah. I, think oh, I think he will. I think he will. I think he will. I think he will. I think he will get game time. Yeah, so Whether it's at 10 starts. or 12. Um, he might get a start against uh, an Italy, Italy or someone like that, or even a Scotland. You just don't know. Depends, probably not. But. Imagine we have a Jack Crowley starting at 10 against Ben oh, Healy. Realistically, Scotland. you shouldn't be oh, starting God. Johnny in five games. Like, you really shouldn't. But we don't know what. I, I, I trust in Farrell. I do trust Farrell. I do as well. Yeah, yeah breakout star for me. Uh, Seco Makalu plays for France. Yeah, yeah. I know he's know plays for Stade Francais as well. He runs like a back and he's mm. huge. Yeah. And I just think he's incredible. Probably one of the best athletes I've ever seen. Yeah. In the world. Watch out for him playing for France. He he's back row, is he? plays in the back row, but yeah. he stands out in the wing. He plays as a winger in face play. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, I, 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 he's yeah. a he wasn't a Stade Francais. He, in his beautiful pink jersey, he went... Um, Around the pitch or something. Yeah, yeah. He, he scored like a winger. like. Yeah, and he plays freak. sevens. Isn't he the next seven? Yeah, he's there? crazy yeah. fast. like, yeah. And he's just massive. So him, I think he's going to be the proper breakout. Nice choice, actually. He's been around for a while, but I think he's really like uh, kind of leveled out now and mm. matured a bit. So, And France are utilising his athletic abilities out in the wing. So watch out for him for France. Winners of the Six Nations, I think it's going to be Ireland. Ireland. But we're going to have a loss along the way, I think, at some stage. We're winning on like points difference or something. What do you think, Jason? I think Ireland will just sneak it, I think, yeah. But all comes down to, I don't think there'll be a grand slam yeah. for anyone. I don't think, but it could be wrong. I think if we win the opening game, we will. A grand slam. I think, really? Yeah. I do because I think that would be, be a France big thing. England at home, so that's uh, yeah. I've, I see us. Uh, I think it's going to be a cracker against the French, um, and the, and England. I think will come all guns blazing. But I think if we can get that win away in, in Wales, I think yeah, we could. If any team will have a grand slam and a win, it'll be us. And, and do you think that if we do get a grand slam, it'll be just way too much for us going into a World Cup, and we'll be way too out in front? No, what my only concern is like he d like I trust him Farrell as well, so I do think Jamie Osborne does that needs his time like I had an even argument in my head would you pick Henderson on the bench or would you go with Joe McCarthy um, who's a man mountain like uh, Crowley needs to get game time Jimmy O'Brien's playing well who's our nine so we only have these five matches and then the three um, test matches before World Cup how is he going to use those games to really reward lads Figure who deserve team, it yeah. yes um, like we're talking about Scotland now have great players and they're probably starting 15, 6, 70 but they haven't had depth so that's where Cooney and Ben Healy come in so it is, if you're going to be successful internationally, you need depth. We've probably too much now. And now we're the, like some of the decisions I'd hate to be making them. Mm, yeah, no, it's going to be tough. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see. Wooden Spoon, are we, I think Italy are actually in a good space, Taz, but like who are they going to end up beating? Do you know what I mean? Will they probably get the Wooden Spoon uh, this year? Even though they're in good form. It's a tough one. Everyone's like, in good form. It all depends. Like, I mean, like, Wales could go either way. Wales could beat Ireland. That's the thing. Gatlin coming in there, like, is that kind of, 
it's that joker card like yeah. do you know so like if Wales if we go out and hammer Wales they could just drop and they could finish last Scotland depending on how they get on against England that's where their six inches is going to go and then Italy you'd expect a scalp but you just don't know what you're going to get from Italy so no. it could be any of those three to be honest with you I don't yeah. see it happening to England France or Ireland no do you know no neither do I Right, time for a never stop competing moment of the week, guys. We're giving it to the stalwart out in the West, Tiernan O'Halloran, who, I don't know if you saw the game, he ran and charged down the Lions kicker and uh, Kellen Blade ended up scoring off it. Yeah, so and it's he good got, effort. it was actually his, Jack Harty skip try, skip pass for his try as well. So mm-hmm. he, had, um, he had a great game, actually. Yeah. Tiernan O'Halloran, well done, fella. Still fighting the fight over there in the West. He's been around with you donkeys, like. Good player. Yeah, great player. player. Great guy to have out there. So you get a never stop competing moment of the week. Tiernan, well done, lad. Now, we'll be back with Tig Leader, but first, here's Jason's chat with Leicester, England and Lions star Anthony Watson on behalf of Stat Sports. I have to kick start and ask you about the biggest topic that's in rugby at the moment is this whole new waste tackling, uh-huh. waste high tackling at club level. So it's not just us, not just kids. It's actually like fully grown men and fully women at amateur level who are being forced to tackle now. Uh, some big names have come out like some of your teammates and some guys across rugby um, we're just looking there at the list of guys that have come out Joe Marler obviously massively against it uh, Luke Cowan Dickey um, even uh, Lewis Ludlow was saying it even that World Cup winner uh, Pat Merchant she was saying that she retired from rugby due to concussion like, but hers was from from hip tackles from from low, from low banks even Sonny B. Williams was laughing saying that if there's anyone in any clubs in England looking to sign him up, like he reckons his off game would be pretty good. But <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think? I mean, do you think it's silly like or do you think it's the right move or what? Uh I mean, being brutally honest, I do think it's it's a bit um what's the right word? It's probably just a bit rushed in my opinion. I think that the, it probably needed to be um A, it needed player input, in my opinion, or more so than whatever it did have um, both professional community. I think that player input is vital to any changes that need to happen because we're the ones who are playing, not the the lawmakers, not the guys who, um, you know, look at, you know, all the health stuff, et cetera, et cetera. You need guys who are on the, the front line who can, who can tell you what they think. Um, so you can make a, a fully rounded judgment. I think that anything that doesn't include the players and that's from law changes to, any implementation of, of anything across the game needs to have the players' input. And so far, um, not just with this, with everything, it doesn't seem to happen. Um, but, yeah, in terms of, you know, concussions happening as a result of, of high tackles compared to low tackles, I would probably say that from my personal experience, um, I definitely feel that low tackles, particularly, like you said, around the knees, around the hips, do generate... Um, you know, more of a risk than otherwise. Um, and, you know, there's obviously certain scenarios where you're not going to be able to tackle low necessarily. So I just think that it's, it is a rushed um, judgment call by whoever's made the, the decision. Um, I think that there needed to be a little bit more dedicated time into what they're actually trying to achieve and how they're trying to achieve it. Um, but yeah, I don't... I, I, I'd be surprised if it if it ends up coming into fruition because I just don't think it's going to work, and I think that it may it, it brings a whole host of other issues into the game that it really doesn't need right now, which is you know people you know not joining rugby because of this very reason, people coming away from rugby because of this very reason, um, and also you know you have to highlight the impact that has on the referees. Um, no one wants a game where which is stop start, and if you're if you're highlighting um, both attacking and defensive players' body height and giving penalties for that, you're going to end up with games where there's 25, 30 penalties and which is basically turns into American football. You stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. It's like, you know, by by alleviating one end of the, the game in terms of, you know, the concussion stuff, you're basically reinventing the entire sport. So, yeah, I personally don't think it's going to work. Looking ahead to the Six Nations, obviously, um, Bortwick is someone you would know see Bortwick well. Obviously, you're with Leicester now, so you've played on him and you obviously would have played with him with England when he was part of the panel before that. Um, what do you think he's going to bring to England? I know you won't be involved at the beginning, but what do you think he's going to bring like, uh, to, to the England setup going forward? Yeah, I think he'll, he'll just add um, an enhanced clarity, potentially. Um, and that's not to say that Eddie didn't provide clarity at all. I would never badmouth Eddie under any circumstance. He was amazing to me, so... 
Um, everything I say about Steve is not at Eddie's discredit. I just want to make that clear. Um, but Steve is, is a very clear coach. Um, he knows and explains explicitly what is expected of players in every position group. Um, his game plans are, are detailed, but also simple, um, which is so easy for players to get behind. Um, he makes it very relevant to each individual as well. So, you know, no matter what the game plan is, you understand what is expected of you within that game plan, which I think is really beneficial. Um, and he's also just a straight talker um, in terms of, you know, whether you're playing or not playing, he'll tell you what he wants to see from you. Um, he'll tell you what you need to do to be started, what you need to do to improve, uh, where you can get 5 10% better. And I think that that's really important. You don't want people to say to you, I'll just keep doing what you're doing because, um, you know, no one gets better in, in that situation. Um, he's very accountable as well. So, you know, he'll say if he made a mistake and I think that that's, it's very easy for coaches to not do that. And he's the first one to say if he's made a mistake, which I think is, it shows how honest the bloke he is and how, um, you know, he understands and appreciates that no one's perfect. Um and then, yeah, his attention to detail is just ridiculous. You know, I, I said it before in the media. At the start of pre-season, he said that he'd watched every one of my carries for three years um, and what I needed to do better in terms of, you know, preserving the ball. So I was, at that point, I was taken aback. I was like, I mean, I don't know how many carries that would have been, but it must have been two, three hundred to sit behind a computer and watch that many clips is insane. crazy. Yeah. You've toured with the Lions in 2017 and 2021. Obviously, I can imagine 2021 was a hell of a lot different because of COVID and whatnot. I'm sure it wasn't as fun. But, yeah. you know, and, and obviously the fact that you didn't get the result over there. But um, any good stories? I mean, I, I have to probably I always love listening about Lions stories and guys uh, getting into mix with other countries. Like, have you any good stories? Or was there any, like, Irish, Welsh or Scottish fellas that you ended up making friends with over that you didn't think you'd make friends with? Oh, yeah. I, I, again, I've probably said this before, but, um, you know, you go on the tour um, and you kind of, you don't know people, but you know of, of other lads from other teams and, and you, you kind of think about, oh, who am I going to be close with and who am I not? And there's obviously a few that I knew I was going to be cool with and I was cool with, like, you know, like Liam Williams, um, Josh Adams, Duhan Landemo. I knew that those guys I'd probably get on with just from hearing about them. Um, but then... You know, there's, there's also guys that you'll think, mate, I'm not going to spend any time with this bloke whatsoever. Like, we're going to have nothing in common. Um, and it's always the props. Like, in, in 2017, um, it was Tyg Furlong. And I was like, before it, I was like, I think I this he's going to be pissed when he hears this. But I'm pretty sure I tried to pronounce his name as Tadig or something like that. And he was <laughs> fuming. Um, and, yeah, I was just thinking before, like, mate, he plays in the front row. I'm on the wing. We couldn't look any different. Um, so like we are not going to be cool and then next thing you know two weeks or a week after the tour we're in Vegas together I absolutely love it life so he was <laughs> one from 2017 and then in the most recent one it was uh, it was Wynn Jones um, again wouldn't it's the farmers mate I don't know what it is about these farmers bro um, <laughs> but um, yeah he was just an absolute legend he robbed me a lot playing cards though um, he's a real hustler, <laughs> sneaky, sneaky bloke. So I'll find a way of getting my cheese back. <laughs> I know, Frank Tyg obviously is like uh, a god over here. Like he's probably one of the most loved. I think it's because I mean, he's just um, there's no bullshit about him, isn't he? And he's pretty unfiltered, yeah. isn't he? A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's what's what's class about those two blokes in particular. Is they're just they don't try and be anything. They ain't. Do you know what I mean? They're just what you see is what you get, and straight talking, straight to it, and that's. That's how it is. Yeah. <laughs> you should have seen him in the you should have seen him in the nightclub in, in the queue for um there's a nightclub called Dre's, which is gen in Vegas, which is generally uh you know, quite uh it's like hip hop rap music. Um I'm not sure Ty knew what he was getting himself into, but I've never seen a bloke look more out of place in the queue in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine yeah. he got some funny looks anyway, with all the dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but mate, he walked in there like he owned the place, so uh, he did all right. <laughs> um, obviously, look, we've chatted about stats for performance throughout the year. So, for anyone listening, we'll have this on our podcast and stuff. And any fans, we obviously know no stat sports as that little vest you put on and your GPS tracker at the back. But for people that wouldn't be aware, like, I mean, what does that exactly measure for players? Obviously, you use them in training and matches. What, what's what yeah. kind of stats are you taking in? Oh, mate, there's so many on there. I wouldn't be able to list 
a lot of them. For me personally, the ones that the main ones that I'd look at is is total distance, which okay. is a questionable measure of all because you know you obviously spend a lot of time walking around and um, you know in breaks you just walk, speak to someone, walk back, and that. So some people don't even look at total volume; they just look at meters above, you know, four meters per second or three meters per second, which is generally running. Um, but my biggest metric would be to look at uh sprint distance um and top speed um you know on a day-to-day you know so like a training week i'll always try and hit above 90 percent of my um max velocity to make sure that you know my tissues and all that are firing and where they should be at and then i've got a metric in terms of how much high speed running i need to be doing in the week all of that is generally just used as as injury prevention and um, and also, you know, if you're trying to get faster, it's, it's easy to be able to see what gains you're making. If you're hitting, you know, nine three, nine four, and it's trending upwards, then you know that your your training is complementing your speed. So, um, I think that it's a it's an absolutely necessary tool for for team athletes and individual athletes as well who are looking to to or who are really serious about training. Um, yeah, I I wouldn't go out and run without a GPS on at all anymore whether it's a straight up 5k or whether it's a, a speed session or whatever i would never do it without a gps or without my stat sports yeah. ever it just wouldn't make sense to me anymore i don't know what you mean Who, who's topping the speed chart thing that's moment surely yourself is it no 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 no. i don't know man. i haven't been back there. i haven't been there yeah this, so, uh, who who's, who, who do you think that would be topping it all like even at leicester who's topping the chart uh, speed? Not, i actually genuinely don't know at leicester yeah I don't know who's got the top. No, I don't. Joe Browning, he's, he's a young, yeah. young uh, winger. He's probably up there. And Harry Simmons, who scored saw score that mental try last week against Claremont, he'll be up there as well. Um, Harry Potter, Guy Porter. There's a lot of fast players at Leicester. To be fair, there is, and and you can never rule out Ashy, Chris yeah. Ashton, bro. <laughs> he's still he's got us. Running fast, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know who'd be the fastest in the England squad now. To be fair, um, there's a lot of guys in there who 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 are surprisingly quick. Like Henry Slade is surprisingly fast. You wouldn't think it, but he's he's quick. Um, and then to be honest, I haven't actually played or trained with a lot of the back three in there now, um, so I wouldn't be able to to pass judgment. But yeah. Ollie Hassel Collins looks rapid, so I'd say him. All right, lads, we have a guest in studio who's. Formerly played with Connacht and then went over to America playing with San Diego and the USA. Mr. Tyg Leader, thank you very much for joining us, sir. Cheers. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, you've had a mad journey since last time I met you. A couple of years ago, um, you were pl- playing with Connacht and since then you've went and uh, applied your trade over in America. Can you give a quick synopsis of your <laughs> journey? Because I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I went over to the US probably like in 20. 20- 15 initially to, to study because I was coming off some surgeries and I was kind of thinking I'm done with serious rugby um, so studying out there and then along came Major League Rugby uh, in 2018 initially I talked to some teams I said nah I'm, I'm not going back I, I kind of had felt you know experienced mm-hmm. that world and you know it wasn't wasn't overly keen to get back into it but then one day San Diego called me and I thought, you know what, there's worse places to do, there's, there's worse places to go for round two in this kind of the, the rugby Definitely. scene. So um, ended up playing there in San Diego, loved it. Um, and then, then I was like, all right, I'm going to kind of get back into this maybe and see, just see where it takes mm. me because it's exciting in the US. It was growing, uh, been there year one and then played for New England Free Jacks, signed there for, say, two years became American eligible. So then got some caps with the US and then that's that was kind of the rugby scene. Then along came COVID and that's, no that, that's when the transition happened over to the American football side of things. And did you get citizenship with America from just being there as a resident? Or no you, chance. No chance. Really? It should be nice to get citizenship because all, all yeah. foreigners, yeah. we all, so many Irish lads, um, some I guess were born or the parents were born there so they get it but for me and a lot of the guys, I think Luke Hart was chatting to Jack the last day, I think Luke is going through you have to get visas and yeah. they have to keep renewing visas so even though, because that was one of my issues in American football, I talked to quite a few American teams but uh, not having a visa or excuse me, not having citizenship and needing a visa just adds so so, so much stress, complications. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, it w- would it be nice to have the citizenship, but now they didn't give it to me. So how did you end up getting playing for America then? The how did you qualify? Three year rule. Three. Yeah, the three the year eligibility rule, yeah, residency. Yeah, 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 yeah. Re- residency. So residency nice. was great. My first time being called in, they were playing against uh, Ireland here in the Aviva back in twenty. 
I think tail end of 2018, and I was having a nightmare with World Rugby around eligibility. So I think the offices are based here. Yep. Yeah. Um, so then I remember them just calling me. I got Greg McWilliams from Bloody Yeah, Mo I was going to ask where you, yeah, you Greg, played under yeah, Greg. Yeah, yeah Greg yeah, was going to the call me. Now. They were in Romania or somewhere random. And I was in Missouri as random. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he's like how far are you from the airport and i was like oh, what's what's the crack what's going on and it's like oh we're, we're going playing ireland next week um and like the general manager of usa rugby was like look because i was having an issue with the eligibility so yeah. I said, let's just get him over here on the ground here so we can kind of like you know get it done maybe quicker being based in ireland um so that was then uh, yeah that was 2018 and i remember kind of thinking like oh, i would be class if i was eligible to, yeah, play, to play this game mm. um Cause I also played in the opening game with the Aviva, so I was like, well, like you know, probably ten years earlier than that. So mm. I was like, what a random kind of series of events would it be to make my debut against Ireland. Unfortunately, it wasn't eligible, oh, but no. I got it a couple of months later, once in twenty early twenty nineteen. So that was the crack with the uh, with the, yeah, the USA rugby sort of stuff. Nice. Class. And what was it like being involved in the MLR that was up and coming? So you went in San Diego and then you swapped over to New England Free Jacks. Yeah, so, so much actually, experience. I also went on loan to New Orleans as well. In between, forgot about that. No <laughs> way. Jeez, nice. A brief one. Yeah. Um, You're not over the place. Oh, it was class. No, MLR is class. Um, Something different. The, the now, infrastructure say, yeah. obviously wasn't, you know, kind of what it is here, say, mm. just in terms. Of, um, but it was growing. And you could see the interest was there. I mean, like, I think our first you know, season in San Diego, we were still getting like 5,000 to a game, which was wow. the same as pretty much just playing in sports ground. Yeah. Um, except you have palm trees and sun every day. So that's <laughs> not mean yeah, it, wind and rain and yeah, frostbite. Yeah. Um, so no, it was good. And then the, the quality of players started to pick up quite a lot. Uh, I remember playing against one of my last games of rugby against New York and Bastero was standing directly opposite me. Class. I was like, oh God, don't come down my channel. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was, it, uh, it was p- it's picking up and it's going, mm. it is going from strength to strength. So a lot better players are getting involved. And I just think it's, it's a kind of six, seven month season. So a lot of lads come from New Zealand. They played that um, either 10 or NPC, whatever, I'm not yeah. sure what it's called now. And then they jump over and do a Major League Rugby season or some guys do Japan and Major League Rugby. So uh, the level of play picked up a lot. The interest, just the general from the fans, that was where the biggest thing. People would always be like, hey, I have no clue what the hell was happening there when you guys were lifting each other up. Or, <laughs> you know, when these guys, the eight guys hit each other. But like, I loved it. You know, remember after the game, he was chatting to fans. Yeah. They're like, oh, I loved it. So you can see that there's, if it's done right, and I guess Major League Rugby's doing a decent job, that that it hopefully be a pretty good catalyst. Although USA Rugby hasn't been great the last few years. But hopefully yeah. um you know it's, it's it is exciting and people get behind it so well, it's a good place to live and play and experience that yeah a lot of Irish lads going over like yourself yeah. obviously will leonard who i played shannon or see with he's over there sean mcnulty harry mcnulty went yeah. over as well a different a different kind of way of going about it. i think Colin marsh was there as well yeah, right, he's playing new york yeah yeah so it's definitely a cool route to do um and do you think mlr is a good option for irish guys to jump over and play rugby over there even though the usa as you said not not in a great the spot. national body's yeah. not but i guess they the ma- as we were described as described to us once pretty early, um, kind of the infancy of the league was like, we're like this is a, we're not USA Rugby, we're on we're our own entity, but it's, it's like it's a entertainment brand, which is the first time I ever heard that kind mm. of a, you know the hierarchy telling us like we're entertainment, we're not yeah. like a rugby club. So American, yeah. Like, I remember yeah. being like, oh, this is different, because um, that that was that, that team uh, that team I was with in in Boston, I was the captain, but I just come off doing like a sports management degree, so I got to kind of s- step in a l- to see more behind the scenes. How it, how it all kind of worked. And remember, yeah, a lot of it was different, but no, I highly recommend it, especially lads who were kind of chatting off air, especially lads that are, you know, you could be at a province for three, four years, you might get five games a year maybe. Mm. And, um, you know, hopefully you kind of progress, but if not, like it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good scene to go play. If you, if you go and perform, I think it's respected enough then that you can come back. Quite a few English guys last year went over and then went mm. back to the premiership. So yeah. it's, a, it's a great place to get game time. And then just the culture of it and like where you get to go, things you get to see. Um, is good life yeah, it's, just so diff- it's just yeah, so different with what what we get access to here, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I'd I'd be a big advocate of uh, giving Did it a crack. Ignite your love of rugby after probably like just turbulent time and injuries and just kind of resigning to the fact that you were going taking a different path. Yeah, oh, d- massively. Um, it was yeah, just enjoyed it again. Yeah. I guess I got into a bit of coaching as well at that point as well. So I started to love rugby again. Um, so yeah. as I mentioned, yeah, playing in these kind of locations that def- are. The experience and I guess in Connacht I was just holding the tackle bag bloody choose it you know during the week and then you play yeah. it at the weekend and you know so it's just kind of like ah oh, and then you get hurt and then you're in the physio room and it's just it was a bit and then it's pissing rain half Sucks the time so it was just kind of, yeah there was yeah. no fun there was absolutely zero fun you so get what you love it like yeah, yeah, um, yeah so I kind of lost that so yeah definitely the experience in the US reignited that and then uh, as I said the coaching was class as well to try and 
get into that world of something that I'm, I guess, doing now that it was, it, uh, yeah, it came at the right time for me. And was it Greg who contacted you about USA Rugby or did that just like, was he someone who drew you into that because of the Irish connection? Yeah. So when I first went over in 2015, I remember that at the time, the general manager of the national, they kind of reached out and said, hey, you, you will be eligible in X amount of years. Yeah. So I guess it was always on my radar. But then all of a sudden I was ineligible. I went over on a rugby scholarship. I was ineligible to play rugby. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was a bit of a... Uh, <laughs> Not great. <laughs> Thankfully, my scholarship was academic. They worded it as academic, so I managed to keep my scholarship. Otherwise, you know, it's nice. quite expensive. So that worked out. Then I got into actually coaching and rugby agencies for like a year, which is interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, then when Greg got involved, he was the attack coach. Um, I guess we had like a few chats, and then yeah, but he, he was he was definitely helpful. He was definitely helpful in getting me in and kind of giving me some opportunity. And uh, it was nice. It was there was a big there was a big group of Irish lads, and at the time they were just beating Scotland. Like lost to Ireland, but I think looked like to the 60th minute was like you know yeah, within a try or so. Um, so the team at the time was riding high, and there's, there's such a big Irish connection. And Paul Mullins, a lad from Galway, well, he's out in Ireland, but like another Galway lad and stuff. And it was it was very kind of welcoming. AJ was captain, and like just flying, you know, he's 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 world class. Um, yeah. So it made it much easier, you know, it made it much easier to acclimatize to yeah. a new environment. There's a lot of just familiar faces, or at least the accent and the cracks the same. I could literally talk to you about that for <laughs> all day. Couldn't we, Lindsay? Like it's so interesting as a rugby path. But as you said there, you've moved into now coaching young fellas, especially Irish guys, and trying to get them over to America. So give us a synopsis of what you're doing. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, from day one in the sport, it was obvious that for kicking and punting, so punting's out of hand, kicking's off the ground. Um, that there's so much room for I, like us Irish people to do it because we're just like natural, naturally good kickers. Mm -hmm. I, I say it's in our DNA, pretty much. We go up striking a ball for the crack, or I was playing like Gaelic football, rugby, soccer. Mm. So anyway, I just realised that there's a huge opportunity there f for us to do that. There's just no pathway, and I would have loved to have done that if that existed for me. So say 15 10 15 years ago yeah. so now basically just coaching irish lads um ranging from 15 to almost 30 that want to go to college and get an undergrad degree because there's no age limit it's just it's, it's all deemed by uh, the ncaa eligibility so do you have eligibility to play oh, in yeah. college so age isn't necessarily a factor um so just coaching them the first lad i started working with who we're talking to with multiple colleges now to get him a full scholarship to go do his master's degree um this uh, august august of coming so there's a world of opportunity, full scholarships. To, like, you know, you get to experience football. College football is mega. The education side of it, you get your undergrad or master's, whatever it is you're looking for. And then also then just for kind of upon graduating, then the odds of you going pro are not high, realistically. Mm. Very few will do that. But, you know, you, you can kind of, you're well equipped for, the, say, the next stage of life. Plus, you get a visa to live in the U.S. for an extra year and experience that. So basically trying to start that pathway and uh, open it up. And thankfully, it's been going well. The interest is interested levels are high kicking talent is high but that's no surprise yeah. um so sounds like some crack where were you seven years ago when i was looking for, <laughs> to do something yeah. yeah how unreal would that be Lindsay? that would be uh, yeah well i'm thinking to myself geez if i had known this 10 years younger i would have gone to <laughs> yeah. the states for you know a scholarship but how do you then link with the universities where is your role as the are you like the in-between guy to get them athletes do you know what i mean like yeah, so yeah. it works um <clears throat> so i'm basically there's a lad in the us one of my first kicking coaches who you know, knows the landscape, knows the scene, knows the crack over there. So he's, I guess, he connects those pieces. My job more so is to find the talent, develop the talent, train them, get good footage of them training, and then I Send give it to Brendan. Team. And then Brendan's over there, and then Brendan does the, uh, connects with all the colleges. Social media is like the recruiting, everything happens Huge. on Twitter. Everything happens on Twitter. Because when I first started playing, I was really skeptical I, I didn't really want to be posting stuff too much on social media because i don't know is it just irish it's an irish me? thing yeah. <laughs> yeah i was really hesitant to do it and i was told tiger you have to do it if, mm. uh, if you don't put stuff on social media because no like, scouts won't see it like they use but for college or pros it's a huge avenue fortunately eventually kind of got over that kind of mm. trepidation and then irish people were class in in supporting in fairness they were really good and now with what i'm doing now they've, they've been um like one of the <laughs> up on TikTok got over a million and a half views the last day. Like p people find it interesting and they've been supportive in trying to like, you know, see one of our own kind of go do something. Yeah. And I'm, 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 there's going to be a bigger path to it. And I guess one of the biggest reasons why this is so confident it will work is in Australia, they started this maybe 10 years ago. And now there's over 110 Australian punters on full scholarships in America. Wow. Yeah. So it's not as if this is a revolutionary thing. Like they did it. They did it really well. So I guess we're just trying to do our you know, something for the Irish lads. And some Irish lads had to move to Australia to get coached to then go to America. Not everyone can do that or afford that or, you know, yep. it's not feasible for a lot of people. So, um, you know, if we can keep it local, 
that's the plan basically and keep it in Ireland that the lads can avail of that and get a, you know have a crack off it. yeah it's amazing what you're doing I love that you're completely gone just left the field against the grain yeah. doing something cool like to, rather than just show there's nothing wrong with it but just playing IL doing your job here and just not looking at the rest of the world so if I was a young fella and I presume it will eventually stay into young girls as well how would we get in touch with you and get involved and get kicking over in America yeah so your best bet <coughs> is to uh, go to leaderkicking.com and there you find like an interest form on the website so you can fill that out and I guess kind of just ex I tell people just come explore just come give it a crack see how you do if you're good we can help if not at least you, you, you yourself will be happy that at least you tried mm -hmm. you're not going to die wondering so that's the crack with that and then actually I was focused only in American football but now over the last few days I've been a lot of people reach out about kicking uh, rugby kicking so I love it there's a space that I wasn't maybe going to get into but I was coaching like under 14 girls at the weekend in Athlone <laughs> and uh, I was class I like in terms of for me seeing like a how much they liked it and b how much better they got over an hour and a half so let's hope i'm hoping i can try and coach more female rugby players because american football unfortunately right now is, is it's male dominated mm. but i like i have i know i have a lot of knowledge to give i i'm confident of that around the kicking because i learned so much there's so much in rugby that we don't we don't know about kicking i guess which i learned to the nfl side of things because they're hyper analytical and so much detail so anyway i'm hoping to do more kicking coaching um it was open to everyone, but I really enjoyed coaching the like w uh, women's rugby and stuff. I, 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 I just say, yeah, yeah, I felt like it, it just saw them develop quicker. So if I can help there, it's a space I want to I want to get into. Oh, hugely! And there's a huge space there on the uh, as regards the evolution of the women's side of the game because obviously in the men's we kick to territory. Uh, the kicking is a lot more, you know, whether it's scrubber kicks or you're kicking for territory or you know a box kick. We don't. It's only starting to come into the mm. women's game now, so I think it's an area where you can really just help accelerate that. We've obviously struggled then with tens and kicking and conversion. And so I think that side of the women's game is certainly an area that needs that that help and that evolution, not only because, again, we're kind of it's kind of a lack of that framework as of now. Hopefully that will change. But like unless you're going to international where you're exposed to the likes of, you know, Richie Murphy or yeah. obviously Greg uses his links to get people into yeah. camp. There is no one there at grassroots or club level. Yeah. But so do you, as regards to like the interest form, do you run then camps or do you go out to clubs or do you take individuals on a training pitch or how does that work then? Like, Yeah, they just, um, for example, this weekend, uh, we did a session Friday in Galway, Saturday in Athlone and Sunday in Dublin. So it's just kind of open training sessions, just come down mm. and, and give it a go. Um, we have people that were 15 that almost no one's kicked a ball before American football, but we had people from like senior into county Gaelic footballers down to 15 year olds that are brand, like, haven't really played a whole lot of sport so it's just a quite an open friendly environment just to just to give it a go mm. and unsurprisingly for example the lad that plays senior inter county football he was quite good so then you know i'll like we had a good chat after that you can try and maybe explain more of the pathway and how it works and then for the younger people it's just more so if they enjoy it they can kind of keep coming to training se training sessions so on uh, instagram at leader kicking is what we post a lot of stuff and um you get more information there i suppose yeah because you, you ran a great competition there in line oh, okay. with the college football, wasn't it? In the Aviva, yeah. which was obviously nice for you with the links of your rugby heritage and then your new path with American football. Yeah. So yeah, it was king of the kick. Ireland, was yeah, Ireland's kicking king. That was just a random idea. I was sitting down in Toronto talking to some CFL teams to re-sign and I wasn't sure to get re-signed with the team because mm. I, I, I did have a good preseason. I, I, so I had that kind of interest. But uh, with that game happening in the Aviva, I just sent an email to them saying, hey, I have this idea that I want to try and coach kicking in Ireland for American football. You guys have a big college football event going on. It's kind of a bit of parallels. Can I basically attach myself to this somehow? And they were like, yeah, if it, we had a few calls. They're like, oh, you seem relatively confident. We let you go with it. So <laughs> I did Ireland kicking Kings events around, figuring it out as you go, mm. but thankfully it worked out. Um, but we had maybe a hundred people kicker on Ireland and then the top three got to kick in the Aviva at halftime during yeah. the college game. So no, three lads, 17, I think 17, 18, 19. And they got to go kick in front of 45 odd thousand. And uh, then the winner of that uh, was crowned Ireland's kicking king, 17 year old lad, really, really, really good fella. And then he got to go over to the US, got to go take nice. his flights over to America, yeah. got to go to a college game, um, experience that. And, and he's one of the guys that's him and his family have committed now. They're saying we want to we want to go to US. We want Andy's name to go over to the US as a kicker on a scholarship because they they experienced it themselves over there and he's a talented kicker. So now they've, you know, they've because he was in the current rugby system, got released. Talented player, but eventually, you know, like if he wants to stay in elite sports, like this is now an avenue for him to to use his natural kicking talent and mm. to go do it. So um yeah, that, that event was class and that kind of confirmed to me that A, I'm retiring from sports because 
they were really interested in family dynamic. They've a lot of stuff that went on and just like health things. And I remember after the game, he had his crown and uh, one of the one of the younger brothers is kind of recovering from cancer. Oh, and uh, now they're an amazing family. But I remember they all kind of embraced and then he put the crown on his younger brother's head, oh. seven year old. Oh. And I remember just kind of I was just detached from it. Uh, I was just kind of watching. And I remember just just they all came together and they're all just like smiles, a bit of emotion. I was like, oh, this is class. If I if I can like provide a vehicle that can like create more of those moments and even get tingles of it now. It was it was at the it was at that moment I was like, I think I'm done with sports. Yeah, and yeah. Like, yeah. And yeah I was like, yeah. this feels really purposeful, impactful. And uh yeah, it was just re- one of those moments, you know, it's just kinda like, okay, I need to do this. That's and amazing. since then like... that's that's been uh, full steam. Yeah, it's Lovely. completely you found your passion man and I love yeah. that you're you're really going head for heels over it. Um, one person before to wrap up, you did start doing a bit of coaching with John Cooney as well. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, if, if like John's curious, John's just a curious fella. Like uh, open to <laughs> Anton, he is. Uh, he's brilliant. Just any way to get better. So I went up um, just doing some rugby kicking stuff because I still have. I le- as I said, I learned so much from American football kicking that applies to rugby. So John was curious to hear about that. Firstly. Mm-hmm. And then we just started kicking American footballs. And uh, yeah, he sent me videos now the odd time of him banging over kicks and uh, saying, can you get a team to sign me? So uh, <laughs> <laughs> get Scotland to sign get, him. Get, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's another story. Um, but yeah, no, it's good. It's good crack getting to yeah. kick with a lot of the current, say, pro players as well. And yeah. um, hopefully it can help them out in some capacity or just for a bit of crack kicking a ball that you know we all love that so yeah. yeah well you obviously know what you're doing if you're teaching John Cooney how to kick so well done Tyke thank you so much for coming in what you're doing is amazing I'm sure Lindsay we could talk to him all day about it Absolutely. but we have to let you go eventually we'll watch the space and wish you every success with it and Cheers, yeah. thanks for having me on and yeah no that's uh, hopefully yeah, people hopefully people might see it and then think you know what I may as well give it a try and like that's all I'm trying to do is just give it a crack and if it's for you great if not at least you'll be happy at least tried it yeah. definitely yeah and if it works out they can go to America get educated yeah. and start kicking for a college team it's class why not we should have got a field actually you could have put yeah. me and Greg through our faces uh, yeah. and Pat <laughs> <laughs> we'll do episode 2 and we'll yeah. do that one yeah uh, no thanks so much Ty. appreciate it and thank you Lindsay for your insight as always thank you Greg cheers and thank you to Bank of Ireland of course our proud sponsors and uh, sponsors of the four Irish provinces we won't be around next week guys unfortunately but we will be popping up over the next couple of weeks so keep an eye out wherever you get your podcasts and of course on YouTube and bye for now Joe presents House of Rugby United Rugby Championship together with Bank of Ireland proud supporter of the four Irish provinces.